Hello, Peter Roger. Hello, Lilou. How are you? Bien, merci. <laughs> no, we won't do this in French, but uh, I'm really thrilled to be interviewing you. You're the filmmaker uh, and you directed an amazing, phenomenal movie called Oh My God. And That's you've been touring around the world for two and a half years, apparently on over 23 countries, to ask one simple question to people. That's correct, actually. Mind you, more than one, one, one question at the end. It kind of got into a few more questions, but there was one main question. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us what an animated you to do this movie? Yeah, I was actually frustration. You know, I, I found that the, um, the way things were going in this polarized world, that uh, there was this real schoolyard mentality, this kind of childish notion of my God is greater than your God. Um, you know, which you could, you could, uh, you could say was, um, you could apply to 9-11 where you had grown men flying airplanes into buildings going, God is great. Or, you know, you've got the leader of the free world who said in 2003 to the BBC, I invaded Iraq because God told me to. Mm -hmm. And then you've got young women and young men who blow themselves up and innocent other human beings to, in uh, quotes, um, buy them a place into heaven. So I thought this is really childish. There's something very wrong in this world that people would use the entity, this name of God, for such nefarious agendas. So I, I decided to go around the world and ask people what God is and see if I could throw some light on this uh, So how did, this you, how did you go about it? How did you, how did you select those particular people to be interviewed? Or where, where did you go? Who did you interview? How did you go about that? Uh, it was a long, hard, difficult journey. I, I started, first of all, by, um, you know, breaking things down. You can't make a film about what people think God is without actually exploring some religions, particularly the main ones. I wanted to go to colorful places like India. I needed to go to the Holy Land. I needed to go and cover all the main monotheistic religions. So I started off actually by uh, wanting to go to Morocco to start. But unfortunately, um, the day that I, I was flying out from Los Angeles to uh, Tangier in North Morocco, uh, was the very day in 2006 that the terrorists struck uh, or were thwarted actually by the by the British police. You know why you can't take bottles on planes these days? Mm -hmm. That was that day. And so I arrived at the airport and they made me check all the camera equipment in. I couldn't take anything in hand luggage. Normally you take stuff hand luggage when you're filming, but I couldn't. So um, it all went in the hold and I never saw it again. It was stolen. Mm. So that was a big setback. Um, and actually, when I arrived in, uh, in Morocco with nothing, absolutely not even a toothbrush, and $100,000 of a camera equipment, so all my notes, my computers, myself, and everything gone, I, I, I went, I really, should I really be making this film? Is somebody trying to tell me something? Yeah, your so, own uh, faith probably has been very challenged during the whole trip, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, well, the whole thing was a leap of faith, actually. Mm. Um, and um, not that not that I'm uh, r remotely religious, um, but you know I felt more like Indiana Jones. You know when he comes mm -hmm. to the edge of the precipice, and you know he's just been through the the three tests, and the third test is coming up to be able to get the Holy Grail, and so he's at the edge of the precipice, and it says you know just just take a, a you know just take a leap, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and you'll be fine. And, he, and he's, he's looking there, and he's going, well, there's nothing. There's nothing there. I'm going to fall down the precipice. But Indy being Indy, he, he actually shifts his perspective and sees that the, there is a bridge there, but it's, it's painted in the same contours of the rock strata behind. And it was hidden. It was there, but it, he couldn't see it. And he puts uh, dust on it and, of course, reveals a bridge and steps across. So I felt a bit like Indiana Jones. And so what, what happened, to get back to your original question, mm -hmm. is I had to regroup and it took two months to do that i had to get the insurance back from the from the guys for, you know for, for the camera equipment i had to um start the whole thing again so then i decided to do a road trip across the united states and leave airplanes out of it for a while because i didn't want to be um <laughs> didn't want everything to be stolen again so i went across the states and i went to new orleans which was suffering from katrina at the time and i just found different people's ideas of god and decided to let fate sort of take me on that journey and then I did what um, 
I used throughout the rest of the film is that I found anchor points, like people that I knew would be really interesting to be in the film. And then I would go and see them, but allow time around their, um, uh, in my itinerary in that particular country so that circumstance can set in. And, and mm. you know what happens? You, you're talking to somebody, they say, oh, you've got to go and see this guy down the street. Oh, you've got to go and see this guy. So I allowed that to happen. So there was an organic um, way of actually finding people to be in the film. What I didn't want to do is just make the mistake of doing, um, you know, professional God people, you know, yeah. like leaders of all because you're just going to get them touting the party line. You're not going to get something from the heart. I wanted to feel what people thought God was from inside rather than from what they think they have to say because they've been paid by an institution. So that's kind of how I did it. And you, I went went, to you went country. to Holy Lands. So. Of course, because you know you you know you can't make a film without without going to Israel and the Palestinian territories and where all this politicization of what people do with God is taking place on the conflict basis and where you have people who are tearing um, you know I mean look look what's happening in, in Israel today with uh, building on um, on Palestinian land and and the repercussions as far as a, pre a peace process are concerned. Now I mean I happen to think that the whole conflict in the Middle East has nothing to do with God. It has, has to do with land, with money and emotion. It does, has nothing to do with God whatsoever. But if you look at, throughout history, you know, the roots of this are people's claims on that land because of what they think God said. And mm -hmm. so, so, it, so you have encountered that, haven't you, along your journey? You have truly encountered people. You talk to extremists, Oh, yeah. Uh, it was hard. That was a really difficult thing. But actually, eventually, they sort of came to me. Um, I wanted to put across the... Um, I've lost you. Hold on. I wanted to put across the, um, you know, the politicization of what people do in God's name. It was really, really important. And, and plus, everybody is still affected by the repercussions after 9-11 and people... Uh, and this polarity that's going on and, like, the sort of... Um, the misinterpretation of Islam and how fanatics take that and, and use that as, as victims and an excuse to, to lash out against America and the Western world, which to them represents something else. So I wanted to hear what their voice was and why they would do that and why they think that their God is any different from anybody else's. And so I spent a long time trying to find fanatic uh, mm -hmm. voices. And of course, nobody would say anything on camera. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, you know, I, I walked around... Palestinian territories. I walked around um, in you know, Muslim countries because everybody um, knows that there's an awful lot of um, of uh, you know angry people because of repercussions yeah. etc. in the world in these places. But nobody would talk. But then finally, I found them, and then fanatics came to me. And then I went to Kashmir and interviewed uh, militant terrorists. Um, and and what I found was was fascinating. I mean, it, it's it's really interesting in the film to to look at these people and to hear what they say because what that, what's coming out of their mouths is so unbelievable uh -huh. and has absolutely nothing to do with what the holy book says and how the misinterpretation of it is coming across and 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 how that clashes with yeah. um, the rest of the world and also how, how a lot of people have held their particular religions, uh, they've hijacked them, um, a small group of evil-minded individuals have hijacked uh, yeah. Islam. So how did you go with, about with your questioning? Because it must have been quite life-threatening sometimes to even dare to ask those questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, the, the thing is about life-threatening is that there's, I call it photojournalist syndrome. Um, <laughs> and because my father was a, a very big photojournalist, he, he, um, he told me about this. He was a war correspondent for Life magazine and then he founded Magnum Photos, which is a, a large photo agency. Mm -hmm. And so he would tell me about photojournalistic syndrome. And he got a lot of people killed, like Robert Kappa and Shim Seymour and, uh, and Werner Bischoff in, in the middle of the last century. Um, but basically what it is, is you feel, you feel somehow that that lens mm -hmm. in front of your face um, protects you to a degree and that you're immune to, to things going around you, which is absolute, absolutely not true. I was just about mm -hmm. to use an exclusive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and so you know you you do you, you fall into a false sense of security. So what happened with me is when I was traveling in in uh, parts of of India that were under threat from terrorist naxalites etc. 
uh, which is another form of, of terrorism that's going on in, in Gujarat and places in India. Um, I, uh, I didn't know and I didn't feel that I was under threat, but I was. I just felt that I was fine, which is complete naivety. So I was lucky. And then at other times I was, and you know, I was chased around a few times. And, you know. and, and so you asked the question, um, what is God rather than who is God? Can you tell us about that? Yeah, because uh, um, when you say who, you're, you're putting God into the image of man. You're, you're, you're humanizing, you're making him an anthropomorphic. And so I didn't want to do that. I, I, I wanted to look at this entity from an objective point of view, almost like I'm an alien coming down to earth and talking to these people on this big rock and going, uh, well, you're worshiping this, this entity, this thing called God. Well, what is God? I didn't want it to be who is God, but because by saying who is God, you're you're um, making... Um, you're already uh, taking part of that conversation. Well, yeah, you're also, you know, envisioning a man with a white beard upstairs in the clouds, right. you know. Um, and I didn't want to because I think God is, is, is a word and, and it, it, it describes so many things that so many people feel from so many belief systems that you can't possibly say who. I mean, there's some people who think God's a she, so if you say who, you've got to go he or she or then it. So I just wanted to be it rather yeah. than he, That's she or who. Yeah, the concept, the entity of what is God. And you were particularly moved by uh, children's uh, uh, answers, weren't you? Well, you know, kids, really, if you think about it, are the most purest form of humans. When they pop out and they're uh, just beginning to interact with people and things and stimuli around them, there, there is a purity about them. I mean, there are not many kids in the preschool schoolyard that, um, you know, discriminate. They're not going to discriminate another child because of the color of the skin or because of a different sex or because they're disabled or whatever. Uh, they just accept life in a joyous, wonderful, pure manner. It's when the influences around them, the people they're surrounded by start affecting them and teaching them, their parents, their schools, their society, their cultures, their country, uh, their belief systems, that they start to become the people they are and then form, you know, blocks of opinions. Uh -huh. And this is, and, and so I find children to be ultimately uh, pure in heart. And if I was to use a, a term, I suppose I could, you know, if, you, if you're looking for godliness, then surely you're going to find godliness in children because there is that unbelievable truth and and link to to the wondrousness uh, of the uh, answers. And and where where else in which cultures did were you really moved and touched by the purity of people by their definition and their view of God? Well, to be quite honest, I was touched by most people because I find that there's an effervescent humanity that exists in the world that binds us together. Doesn't. Um, doesn't pull us apart actually, it's something that is inherent in, in, in human beings. So I was blown away by most of the cultures that I visited for particular reasons, but if I had to choose I would say that I felt most at home with the more indigenous populations because I felt they had something really simple but that simplicity seemed to make much more sense to me as a human being. So I loved the Maasai in Africa, I found that the most incredible experience just hanging out with those guys. Um, because they have, they're just really happy. Uh, they don't have all of this, this, um, this filters stuff, and filters, and you have to do this and you have to do that. Uh, unfortunately, there's a whole thing in the film as well about how um, the Pentecostals are coming in to to try and convert all these indigenous populations to Christianity, and there's a lot of confusion because they do that by saying. Unless you convert, you're going to go to hell, and I'm here to, to save you. So I, I found that a little sad. I also liked the the um, I liked the Aboriginal sensibility. In um, you're talking, but I can't hear you. No, no, I'm not talking. I'm just I'm listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for a moment you were saying something, and, and you've gone silent. No. Um, so I. I really liked the Aboriginal cultures. I liked uh, all the indigenous ones. Um, I enjoyed. Um, I enjoyed India very much. Uh, I enjoyed Balinese Hinduism. I enjoyed um, uh, the colourful, wonderful uh, sensibilities of the people in, in in sort of some of the poorer places in the world who have this inbuilt sense of happiness without all this craziness going around that uh -huh. most of us in the world experience. You know, like mortgages and um, yeah. this and that. 
how how did it change your life coming back? I mean, you, you live in Los Angeles with your wife and your children. How did that change? How did that change you? Are, are you seeing Los Angeles the same way? Are you going to stay there? Do you? Yeah, it's just as crazy as it always has been, and uh, driven by people's desires to be something. Um, I, I, I mean, the thing is that when when I go away from Los Angeles and I return, I'm pleased that I'm back. But when I'm here, I want to leave. So it's a little bit of a catch twenty two. I and how how did it affect me? Well, I mean, I think just outlook. It was a very tough thing to do. I I, I really put my family through a lot of um, difficulties making this film because I was away for a long time, and uh, it was not easy um, doing it. You know, it costs. Yeah. I kind of lost a lot of money doing it, and I yeah, haven't. Yeah, I heard. Can you tell us about that? But you you self financed it at the. Uh, is it how how did you work this out? Because Two and a half years traveling. Well, I, I self-financed like half of it, and then I, I sold half of the film to a wonderful um, financier who came in and, uh, and and financed the rest. But you know, it's a long-term commitment, and it's, it hasn't really been released yet. So, you know, you you've got to wait for the money to come back. And then, then I've also done a, a book which I've just finished writing, which is coming out on November the first, called the OMG Chronicles. So I've been working on that, um, and it kind of took over my life. So. You know, the so how did it change me? Well, I found I found a lot of good. I found lots of things that went around in the world that um, you know people don't talk about. I found that good news is no news. I found that a lot of people are politicized. I found that uh, when you know when you break down people onto an individual basis on a human level, they're really kind of cool, and there is humanity within them. It's just that these groups just. Um, are manipulated by people with nefarious avengers, which causes the conflict in the world. But I also understood that this is part of awareness and learning. And the other thing is that, you know, in life, we are challenged by the things that we don't particularly like, and those are the things that make us grow. And, um, you know, you can't just look for life to be all roses all the time. You know, you, you have to accept life as a balance. You can't have the yin without the yang, the black without the white. Um, the dark without um, the daytime, so or you can't have peace without war sometimes, and so you know these things are thrown at us to to learn, and you know I learned a lot by doing this film. <laughs> mm. So would you say that God is nothing but love? No, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't. I, I, I you know, everybody asks me what is God after this big journey, and. Uh -huh. I have to say that um, at the end of it, you know, it's it's really up to what the individual thinks God is. But if you force me and put a gun to my head, I, I think I would have to say that it's kind of the the very reason that we're here, and it's a wide, wide word which is overused, misused, abused, and um, is misunderstood by many, many people. God, really, I think, is is the um, is the energy that binds us together, that makes mm. us be able to have this conversation with you now. It's, it's the molecules in this table, it's the, you know, the, the light in the sky. It isn't some guy with a beard up there who tells prophets what to do. Um, you know, it's something that is inherent within us, within our souls, within our hearts and, and everything else. Mm -hmm. It's the glue that binds us together. Um, you, can, you can then sub-break that down that, that that you know that also represents love if you want. Um, a lot of people say God is love. Or, um, you know, mm -hmm. it's. I think that it, was, it was Lawrence Blair who said in my film. You know, um, if anybody tells you who God is, mistrust them. Mm -hmm. um, I think God for people is something that they feel right here. And you know, I, I happen to think that you're God. My dog's God. And you know, if I had a cat, that would be God as well. So it's just a huge word that describes everything around so is there, us. It, could, could, could we say that there's a shift in the way God is seen, that now we see it more and more within us? Or did you, did you notice that the, the evolution of God? Were you, were you, did you well, I, th I think, yeah, no, I think, I think there is. Um, uh, I think that people are really fed up with, with being told that, you know, God is this fear-mongering guy with a big hammer that's going to knock you on the head unless you obey um, him and live your life according to his, his word, which is written down in particular monotheistic books. Um, so I think that people are really getting a little bit tired of this concept of, um, of control. 
um, and really understanding the, the things that they feel in their heart, you know, the things that they feel when they look at, a, at their son, daughter, wife, lover, mother, cousin's face and, and the interaction they have with that human being and their responsibility to other people. And, you know, I don't want to knock religion too much. It's not the whole point of this, this film. I mean, I think that monotheistic religions have it right. You can sum it up very quickly for each of them. And they all say exactly the same thing. I mean, you've got, you know, uh, the Jewish tradition, which has the Ten Commandments. You know, it's a really good code of practice. You know, read it. If you're Jewish, read, read the book, read the Torah, and abide by those rules. If you're Christian, I'll have to bring you back because you just disappeared again. If you're Christian, you know, you've got uh, obviously the Old Testament, which is the same as the Torah and the, and the Ten Commandments, but you've also got Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's a really good code of practice. If you're a Christian, read it and abide by those laws. They, they're, from, they're fundamentally very, very good. And if you're Muslim, you have the five pillars of Islam, which is basically the same thing. So what on earth is all the fuss about? And if you apply that to um, other human beings and other belief systems, you know, um, and the way that we have to live on and share on this, on, on this world, then you can understand that everybody's really saying the same thing. There's nothing to argue about. And I think it's time for our karma to run over our dogma. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we really, we really should be able to be individuals and, and understand what is true to us and be allowed to do it. And, and this, there's another thing that I, I look at in this film, and that is the state of paradise and the state of hell. There are so many, yeah. particularly the monotheistic religions, do this do, and do that and do this and, you know, take Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you will be saved, you know, and you will go to heaven. Um, well, it's a great code of practice, you know, Jesus... Is, was a fantastic prophet, but you know I think it's a little bit juvenile to to assume that once you die you're going to have everything great all the time because the real divinity, the real understanding of of love and everything is taking the black and 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 the white together. It's understanding that you can't live your life just happy all the time. How many of you are one hundred percent happy all the time? If you tell me you are, you're lying. How many of you are 50% happy and 50% sad or 50% challenged by things that make you grow as a human being and understand that the, the wonderful sense of life is, is the union of those two polarities? You can't, I mean, light is a union between a negative and a positive. If there was only positive, there wouldn't be any light. If there was only negative, there wouldn't be any light. So people, I think, have misconstrued what the prophets have said and it's become politicized, and that's where a lot of problems happen in the world. But um, I'm hoping that by understanding what a lot of people think around the world about, from what I've found, you'll see that there's a commonality um, and, and a unity. And we're much more united, actually, than we are divided. Mm. Well, I personally think you have done a tremendous, amazing job. And, uh, and, and I really encourage everyone to go and see it. And I know that you have a Facebook page and you have a wonderful website where people can discover more your the, the different events and the screenings and, and how to find it. You're distributed by A House, aren't you? Yeah, and we're doing an amazing job because actually yeah. they 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 uh, they have a a clientele of this of the very type of people that you were talking about. You know, they're, they're, uh, the people that buy their material are. A much more sort of non-denominational, open-hearted um, people who um, are a great market for this film yeah. because it really is taking a step back and looking at God from out here rather than from in there. Mm. And I could see very soon uh, Miss Oprah getting very interested about this. Well, I hope Miss Oprah, if you're listening, um, it's a fantastic stories. It's a fantastic movie that can change so much in the world right now and is much needed. So you're on a mission. I'm on a mission. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. I think it was it was very very nice. You're great to interview. <laughs> Thank you. And the next time next time we'll do it in French. <laughs> oui, absolument. Mais uh, après uh, quelques verres du vin, parce qu'il est impossible de vin. <laughs> <laughs> Très bien.